correction. Contrary to what you have heard, Derek Jeter is not the greatest person in human history. He did not invent baseball. He did not discover electricity. He is not the greatest shortstop who ever lived. And among all the terrific players in the history of the New York Yankees, he is not by any measure number one. Those 10 great Yankees I mentioned, Ruth, Derek, DiMaggio, Mantle, Munson, Nettles, Randolph, Messina, Ruffing, A-Rod, where does Jeter rank among them for best war per season with the Yankees? Oops, he's 11th. He's 11th out of 10. He's behind Red Ruffing. You don't know who Red Ruffing was, do you? Pitcher who also pinch hit, ERA plus of 119 during the slugging 1930s, completed 261 starts through 40 shutouts, eight times in the top 10 in fielding independent pitching, started 10 games in the World Series, Yankees won seven of them. He didn't get a farewell tour either. And we're back at the Steve Malsberg show. I was just immersed uh, in, in Operman's ramp there. That was remarkable. Uh, Joe Concha filling in for Steve Malsberg today. And this is the Malsberg panel. We're going to talk about what Mr. Operman had to say in just a moment. First, let's introduce our panel, co-host of Steel and Unger on Sirius XM. And what channel is that on, by the way, Sarah? Uh, 124. 124. And senior political contributor for Forbes.com, Rick Unger, and senior partner and owner of the law offices of Adam M. Thompson, PC, and syndicated talk show and TV commentator, Adam M. Thompson, Newsmax contributor and political analyst. Wow, that is one long title. Guys, thanks for joining. We appreciate it. Great to be here as always. Sure. So, Adam, I'll start with you since uh, I understand that you are a Yankee fan. Uh, I don't know if you were able to hear uh, Keith Operman's uh, rant on, on Derek Jeter. Uh, in terms of the numbers, uh, Keith is exactly right. He does not have the greatest numbers in the world. Then again, shortstops normally don't have great numbers to begin, at least from an offensive perspective. But still, not to get too deep in the weeds, uh, is there, Derek Jeter, does he deserve to be called one of the greatest Yankees of all time, as in top five or at least top ten? He absolutely deserves to be called one of the greatest Yankees of all time, if not one of the greatest players of all time. Let me just start by putting on my Yankee hat. I was one of the fortunate oh. few to be at the stadium last night, and I've witnessed many games in my lifetime from World Series closeouts to the game after 9-11. The crowd was so electric, I never heard in unison for two innings an audience shout continuously a chant. And for two innings, they were like saying, thank you, D Jeter, Derek Jeter. I mean, it was just incredible. And that's because what keeps Overman missed in his piece was there's more to a baseball player than statistics and numbers. You bring with you character. You bring with you leadership. You just have to look at Lou Gehrig. You have to look at uh, Kyle Ripken. Ripken wasn't a super, super shortstop. He was very good and excellent, but in Baltimore, they'll say he was the greatest ever because of his character, his ability, and what he did beyond the game and off the field. Just like with Lou Gehrig, it's the same with Jeter. He had a winning mentality. He always gave 100%. And just to throw in an extra tidbit, it's not bad that he ranked sixth of all time of every player who ever played the game in hits. Not a simple feat. He had consistency, and the consistency was always with excellence. He was a winner and knew how to win. Wow. Adam, uh, well said. That, that answer was as long as Jeter's career, I think, actually. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was as spirited as you'll ever see. Now, Adam, I'm great you're, it's great you're at the game last night. I mean, God bless you for being able to get, get tickets. I had two friends that were there, and they said that one of them actually just not realizing that Jeter was coming up, was coming out of the bathroom and saw no one at the concession stands. No one in any of the concourses because it was Jeter's first at batty. Oh, my God, he ran there and he saw the double. So, uh, hey, Rick, we, we talk about intangibles. And sometimes we bring up JFK and we say, well, he wasn't the greatest president. Look at the Bay of Pigs. Look at this. Look at that. But sometimes intangibles are a lot more important to an audience, to a country, than numbers. Absolutely. Your thoughts? I mean, Adam really did nail it. He said it perfectly. He said it a little long, but he said it perfectly. <laughs> the Passion, lawyer, baby. you know. Passion. Um, look, this is why Keith Olbermann can't hang on to a job. He can be Ooh. such a yutz. He totally misses the point of what Derek Jeter is all about. A guy who lasts 20 years in the major leagues, I mean, think about that. That's extraordinary. A guy who doesn't get in trouble, a guy who's a leader, a guy who knows how to not talk too much. You know, it doesn't really matter why the people in New York respond to Jeter the way they do. It doesn't matter why, for two solid innings last night, they sat there and chanted, you know, goodbye, Derek. You know, Keith, you're, you ought to watch it. You're running out of places to work. 
Um, you, you're just out of touch. You're out of touch with how people feel. You're out of touch with feelings. Uh, you know, it, it was a stupid rant. Yeah, I, I think he sometimes likes to draw attention to himself. Yeah, that you I, think I, that might have something to do with it? I've heard yeah. that before. Uh, he worked at MSNBC and he went back. And he worked at ESPN and he went back. Keith shows you can go home again. But I think in this case, he wanted to be contrarian just for the sake of being contrarian. But give Keith Oprahman at least this. There is no greater living baseball historian right now who just knows numbers. What he was just saying before of Red Ruffing, he was true. saying that off the top of his head. That was not impromptu. He is like uh, Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, the when, way he can count they, matches on, would, on the ground. Would Nate Silver disagree with that statement? Uh, well, that's a good point. But Nate and him are uh, now uh, co-workers. But uh, to your point, uh, as an adult, as a 43-year-old male, I don't get chills watching anything on television anymore, particularly from a sports perspective. And watching that last night live, and boy, it was set up nicely by Buck Walter, the Baltimore Orioles manager, by the way, because really, technically, with a guy on second and only one out, they should have walked Jeter to create a double play. But Walter, knowing where what this was in history, knowing that he would not get out of the Bronx alive if he walked Eric Jeter intentionally in his final at bat, pitched to him, and Jeter did exactly what he's done his whole career. Go to right field, get that base hit, and again, there are very few good guys left in sports today. You can count them basically on one hand. The Mannings, Tim Duncan, Derek Jeter, and if any of them were ever caught doing anything bad off the field, you would lose all faith in society as far as that's concerned. So, Adam, I, I love you in your hat. If you could keep that on for the rest of the segment, uh, that would uh, definitely be appreciated. Can I, can, I just spoil go ahead, can I just spoil the whole sure. segment by saying, go Tigers? Uh, go Tigers, <laughs> who I believe won the American League yes, Central, they, correct? I, I, you you I just killed the whole segment. I don't want to rain on the, the Yankees segment. today, but yes, it will be the Detroit Tigers this year. Interesting. Uh, Newsmax Sports, uh, Rick Unger says that the Detroit Tigers, <laughs> this who is going to be the headline in Newsmax.com. Unger do. says Tigers. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I'll go in those weeds for a second. They, they, they have gone to the uh, the big dance and, yes. and uh, twice, I think, in the last couple of years, and uh, both times embarrassed themselves yes. uh, on the World Series stage. You had so. to bring that up, didn't you? That's true. True, but the pitching staff you can't argue with, and boy, pitching, we're going pitching, way pitching, deep. Pitching, pitching, That's always the By foundation. By the way, not unlike my other favorite team, the Ohio State Buckeyes, who keep going to the big dance and embarrassing themselves. I'm not sure what this is about. That's true. Can we shift gears for a moment to uh, what our Newsmax <laughs> friends at, at home, our audience, is saying? Look, we love the sports stuff, but you got to move on. Okay, Maybe so Rick we're needs on. to stop endorsing teams because they don't seem to do well after he picks them to win. <laughs> that could be the problem. Well said. So uh, let's go from uh, Derek Jeter, who kept himself in phenomenal shape. Uh, he's nearly 40 years old, if he's not 40 already, uh, playing for the New York Yankees for 18 years. Uh, then we go over to North Korea, where, boy, uh, Kim Jong-un is having some problems. He apparently is suffering, according to the uh, IB Times, uh, from gout due to hereditary obesity. Um, some may make a Michelle Obama joke right here that he should be eating better at lunches and so on. Uh, I am not going to do that right now. But, uh, Rick, are you rooting for your friend Kim Jong-un uh, at this point? I, I only want to know one thing. Can gout kill you? Hey, Adam, uh, do, you, do you know the answer to that? I'm, I'm only uh, pretty long enough to I think any disease that continually spreads and then leads to infection well, can then, kill you. Then so let's, let's root for gout. <laughs> um, who cares that he's sick? You know, I, I have a feeling he's probably going to get good enough care that he'll survive his discomfort. But like I said, I'm rooting for gout. Good point. And, and by the way, you're part of your Detroit Pistons used to have Dennis Rodman on that That's team, right. uh, Rick. Well, so I, I, he I just bring up wait, all wait, the bad wait, stuff. I just heard you're Keith so Oberman... Negative is ranting saying that <laughs> the wins against replacement for gout getting him are like very limited. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to throw that yeah. in. That, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, his war is very low. That's, that's, maybe, that's maybe a very Keith, good point. Maybe Keith Olbermann will do the stats on how many uh, North Korean dictators die of gout. Very good point. Boy, now this is going to be difficult. As an anchor, this is called segueing, and usually you try to pick a word that somebody says in the last answer and do that. Gout. This will be yeah, literally <laughs> impossible uh, because now, unfortunately, I have to go to our third topic, and that's about an ISIS terrorist saying that we will attack uh, New York City soon. And uh, this, according to the Washington Times, uh, Vice News actually uh, picked this up, uh, saying that uh, one uh, gentleman that, it, that is in ISIS, I shouldn't call him a gentleman, uh, one terrorist uh, that should be eliminated from this planet, says, quote, a lot of brothers there are mobilizing right now, mobilizing for a brilliant attack. My friend, uh, we're currently in New, New York right now, Rick Unger. Uh, the ISIS threat in terms of an attack on the homeland, uh, very serious or something that they're only limited really more to, to the Middle East and, and well, to that part of the world? Uh, look, you take anything, any time like this very, very seriously. I know New York does take it seriously and has obviously for a great many years and will continue to. I will add this, though. In my experience, people who threaten 
are usually not the people I worry about. It's those who strike and don't give you the warning that concern me more. Adam, that's a very good point. You know, that there's that scene in Goodfellas. I was, uh, you know, I'm going to totally name drop here. I was hanging with Bo Dieter last week. Ooh. And he was uh, telling me about his scene in Goodfellas where he plays a police officer. And he says, uh, drop it, scumbag. And he puts a gun to Henry Hill's uh, head right before he arrests him. And Hill says in the narrative, uh, you know, I knew that it was the police and not the mafia because the mafia doesn't say anything. Right. They just kill you without telling you. And I think that's, you know, what happened with Al-Qaeda in 9-11. Uh, an attack without warning, element of surprise. So maybe the guys that talked the loudest or the least threat? Only about 30 seconds, Adam, your thoughts. Well, the thing you also have to keep in mind, I think Rick is right on this point, you have to take every threat seriously, but sometimes without even actually doing something, just the fear or intimidation of the threat accomplishes their goal, which is to have people in that location or region panic over the fear of an attack. So they're accomplishing something by just saying it, spreading that fear and terrorism. Only if we buy into it. Only if we buy into it. Thank and you, gentlemen. A lot of people do. And I'm buying into your arguments on that both. So, so thanks so much for joining us. We, we certainly appreciate you joining the panel today. Always a Good pleasure. Here. Well, Newsmax contributor and political analyst Dick Morris, he couldn't join the panel today, but he has a great book out called Power Grab, Obama's Dangerous Plan for a One party nation. Steve Malzberg had the opportunity to sit down with Mr. Morris to talk about the book and other topics, which you'll see later in the show. Be sure to pick up your copy at bookstores nationwide or go to powergrab411.com. We'll be back with Rick and Adam and the rest of the Malzberg